Resourceful Designer, Episode 88, A Designer's Home Office Essentials. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host, he took half his schooling in French, Mark Decote. Welcome to the podcast. I am glad you've joined me today as I have an interesting topic, especially for somebody who's just thinking of starting their own business from home. But if you already are running your own business from home, you may be interested in this as well. And I'm going to go over some of the essentials you should have in your home office. But before I get to today's main topic, I have a a fun story to share with you. Earlier this week, I was discussing a new website for a client I have. Now, this is a client that I did a website for him years ago, and he wants an updated look. Something modern, something today was the terminology he used. And he pointed out a few different websites of unrelated niches, unrelated uh, same space as he is in, but that he liked the look of them. He liked the way they flowed. He liked the, I guess, modernism of the website compared to his website, which was done quite a few years ago. And we started sketching out some ideas of what we would do with his website. Well, after that meeting, I came back home. I put together the proposal for him and got the whole thing signed, contracts and all of that, asked for the deposit, and all is well and good. Then he calls me up a day or so after and he says, oh, Mark, there's one thing I forgot that I saw this on a a website somewhere and I thought this was ingenious. Why doesn't anybody do this? At the bottom of my homepage, can you put a counter to tell people how many people have visited the website? And I I, I stopped and I shook my head and I I thought, okay, he's he's joking with me. This this has to be a joke. Okay, because I know he's a little bit of a kidder. And no, he was serious. He said, oh, I came across a website. It was a little bit older website, but it had this thing at the bottom that said so, so X amount of people have visited this website. And I said, that's brilliant. He says, that way people can know how popular the website is. And I told him, I says, we haven't been doing that since the, the mid to late 90s, possibly the early 2000s. But I can't remember the last website I put a counter on. And it, the funny thing is, is he says he's never seen one before on a website. So I, I quickly put the kibosh to that and I told him, you don't need to know that. You you don't need to be telling your competition how many people are visiting the website, especially when the website's brand new and the counter's so low, it might actually turn people away who, who find the website and see the counter, especially if it's only like 100 visitors, 200 visitors, and they go, oh, well, this isn't very popular. Why would I be interested in it? So, and then I did also explain to him stuff like Google Analytics that can actually tell him how many people are visiting the website. And it turns out that that's really what he was interested on in. He wanted to know how many people were visiting his website. And I says, oh, well, we, there's all sorts of things we can do about that so that you get that information. But a counter on a website, I can't remember the last time somebody asked for that. So that was something fun that happened to me this week. Now let's move on to our resource or I should say, resources of the week. This week, I want to share two podcasts with you. Now, I know you like podcasts because you're listening to me talk right now. I'm plugged into your ears or coming through your speakers, which tells me that you are somebody who likes podcasts and not only likes podcasts, but likes podcasts about design. So I have two podcasts that I want to share with you. Both of them are fairly new. One of them is a podcast called Logo Geek by Ian Paget, and you can find it by visiting logogeek.uk. Now, this is an interview-style podcast where Ian interviews other designers and talks to them about, it's called Logo Geek, so most of it is talked about logo design and the, the whole design life in general, but with the main focus being around logos. And Ian has interviewed people like Dina Rodriguez and Aaron Draplin, and he, he's in his first season. He's dividing his podcast into seasons. He's in the first season right now, and it's really well done. I'm really enjoying his podcast. And the second podcast I wouldn't mind you checking out is This Designed Life by Chris Green. Now, This Design Life is a brand new podcast. In fact, there, there's only one interview out, and interestingly enough, that interview is with Ian Paget of 
Logo Geek. But Chris has been around this space for a while, and he's done, if you go to the website, which is thisdesignlife.net, you can see that there's a lot of what he calls quick interviews. And these are not podcasts, they're, they're written interviews, you can read them. And it's the same, I think there's six or seven questions that he asks designers. And he's got some answers from very well-known designers such as Chris Doe, Sean Barry, Debbie Millman, and many others as well. Although, Chris, if you're listening, you never did ask me. Hmm. <laughs> but both of these podcasts are something I recommend you check out. Now, both Ian and Chris are members of the Resourceful Designer Facebook group. So if you do check out their podcasts, make sure to drop them a line telling them what you think. And let them know that I sent you there. So once again, Logo Geek, which you can find at logogeek.uk. And This Design Life, which you can find at thisdesignlife.net. And both of those podcasts are available through iTunes and Android devices. Just search whatever way you consume your podcast. Just search for them through there. So those are this week's resources of the week. And now this week's main topic, a designer's home office essentials. Now, anybody who works from home, whether you're designing or not, does have certain things that are required in order to properly run a business, whether you're doing this full-time, part-time, just casual, like if you're a freelancer that just does this from time to time, whenever a job pops up, regardless, you do need to have some essentials to your home office. And I'm going to go through, it's kind of a, a list I'm going to go through here of what you need for your space, what sort of equipment you need, what sort of supplies you need, and a few little miscellaneous things. So let's start off with the space that you're going to use for your business. Now, some will say that it doesn't really matter as long as you, could, you have a space dedicated, you're, you're good. But I am of a strong mind that you need a separate room in your house. You need an office. If you are running a business, you can't properly run a business from your kitchen or dining room table or your, your couch in the living room or your bedroom. You should have a separate space. Now, I understand that depending on your living arrangements, this might not always be possible. You might not have a spare bedroom or a spare room in your house that you can dedicate as office space. But if you don't have that dedicated room, you should dedicate a corner or some place that is specifically for work. And it, it's a place where you go to when you need to work. And as I said, the kitchen table, some people swear by it that they, they work from the kitchen table or, or the kitchen counters or the dining room. But what happens is that space has to be transformed. Whenever it comes mealtime, you have to move everything out and then your office is disrupted. And we all know as graphic designers, sometimes we have to work strange hours. Now, I personally try to work a nine to five. And for the most part, that's what I accomplished nine to five at five o'clock. I shut down and I very rarely work past those hours, but I know some designers that'll work late into the evening, sometimes into the early mornings or get up super early in the morning to work. Well, if you don't have a dedicated place to go to, that doesn't always work out for the best. It, it is a good temporary solution, especially if you're first starting out, but you should try to find a dedicated room. Now, not only should you find a dedicated room, but I suggest a room with a door, something you can close to kind of separate you from the rest of the house. Now, this is almost essential if you are designing from home and you have kids. You have to be able to close the door and teach your kids that when the door is closed, mommy or daddy is working and shouldn't be disturbed. And it, it might be hard with young kids, but as they get older, they start to know that if the door is open, then they can go disturb you. If the door is closed, then we, we're not to disturb you. And it does create that sort of boundary where this is the office and everything else is the rest of the house. Now, keep in mind that when it comes to tax season, it's a lot easier to prepare things if you have a separate room in your house dedicated as office space. Now, if you want to know more about taxes and deductions and everything you can make, Look back at episode 18 of Resourceful Designer, which was titled Tax Deductions for Home-Based Graphic Designers. And you can get that episode by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 18. But having a separate room with a door to close it off is very easy when it comes tax time because I can say on my taxes that when I look at the full square footage of my house, 
this percentage of square footage is dedicated to my work. So things like property tax and mortgage, I can deduct a certain percentage of those fees because they are going towards paying for my business space. So that's one of the reasons why having a separate room. And as I said, I I say a door, you don't need a door, but especially if you have young kids or you just want to separate it from the house. If you have visitors come over and you close the door, you know, they're not going to go bother your office. Now, another thing for your office space is make sure whatever room you do choose, it does have good ventilation, both for hot weather and cold weather, whether you need to be heating or you need to be cooling, depending on where you are in the world. Like here in Canada, during the summer months, I need to have the air conditioner on at some times. Otherwise, I'm just going to be drenched in sweat. And during the winter, the heat comes on. So I do have a window that I can open here, but make sure you have good ventilation, especially if you're running equipment like a computer. Computers can get hot. And if you have a room, especially with a closed door, it can get pretty hot in there. So good ventilation is essential. Not to mention it's good for your health. If the air starts getting stagnant in that, you start getting tired and it's just uncomfortable. So good ventilation is good for your health as well. Now, along those same lines, good lighting. As I mentioned, I have a window. I'm in a room at the front of the house. When we built our house, I purposely built this room as my office. It was on the plan. Like we, when we built our house, we based this design on a couple of different house designs that we had looked at. And this house was referred to as the den, which I don't really know what a den is per se, but it became my office. So it has a nice big window, lots of lighting coming in, but I also have a nice light on the ceiling so that if it's that time of the year where the sun goes down, or especially during the winter, when the sun goes down, it's almost four o'clock in the afternoon. It's good to have some really nice lighting to help you light up your, your area. And the last thing I want to talk about for the office space is it's perfect. And this is not always possible, but it's perfect if you have a space with low distractions. And that could be uh, the walls, like make sure you have good insulation in your walls so that if there's somebody in the other room watching TV or playing video games, you're not distracted by the noise. Or if your office is right next to, say, a laundry room and you've got a noisy washer or dryer going all the time that's distracting you, that sort of thing. So just Keep that in mind. And, and as I said, that's not always possible. And sometimes that's just a matter of circumstance, not necessarily the room, but like I can say that I can hear the washing machine when it's running. But most of the times when I'm at work during the day, the washing machine is not running. Now, if I was doing work in the evening, that might be a different case. And it's, you know, will it bother me? Hmm. In my case, it doesn't really. But it's just something to keep in mind that distractions. You don't want to have your office and the, and the wall on the other side be the sound system for your entertainment unit because you're going to hear, especially if you've got a lot of bass in that, you're going to hear that rumbling and it might be distracting while you work. So a place with low distractions. So that's pretty well the office space. I suggest a separate room, a room with a door that you can close off, a room with good ventilation, good lighting, and low distractions. And if you can get that, you're off to a great start for a home office because it's nice to say I'm going to curl up on the couch. And if you have a laptop, I don't personally work from a laptop. I have an iMac computer, so I can't just pick up my iMac and say I'm going to go sit on the couch. Now, if you're working from a laptop, then sure, but you can't run a business day in, day out, week after week, month after month, year after year from sitting on your couch. Well, at least that's my opinion. Some people may be doing it, but in my opinion, it's not the proper way to run a business. So now I'm going to talk about the equipment in your office. Now, I was just talking about a computer, and that's one essential. We are designers. We need a good computer. Now, some people listening, maybe you're not a designer per se, but you're somebody that gets benefit from this podcast. Maybe you're a painter or a sculptor or an illustrator, and maybe a computer is not essential to you. But generally, as a graphic designer, a computer is your bread and butter. You you need a computer to do your work. Now, in my case, as I said, I've got an iMac, a 27 inch iMac that I work on. And some people will have their own preferences. Some people will go Windows, some people will go Mac and and whatever. Some people will go laptops. Now, I do suggest if you are running a laptop, get yourself a monitor, a bigger monitor that connects to your laptop. So when you're sitting at your desk in your office, 
you're not straining on a small computer monitor. Now, there are some computer laptops with big monitors, but most of them, like the biggest one might be a, a 15 inch or a 17 inch. I'm not sure these days, maybe they have 18 inches. But when you compare an 18 inch monitor to my 27 inch iMac, the real estate is just humongous compared to a laptop. And that's why I suggest if you do use a laptop and maybe you do go sit on the couch, go sit in the kitchen, go sit on your, your deck or, or go out to the park or to Starbucks or wherever. And that's great if that's the way you work. But when you're in your home office, it would be really nice to have a monitor to plug it into. Now, speaking of a desk to sit at, there are various options that you can have for a desk. Now, some people swear by a standing desk. And I don't have a standing desk myself, but I do have a keyboard tray that I can lift up to a standing position. It pulls out from under the desk, and then if I tilt my keyboard a certain way, the, the tray um, becomes unlocked, and I'm able to lift it up. The arm actually swings up from underneath so that I can get up into a standing position if I want. And there are times when I do that. If I, my back is sore or something, I have put my keyboard and my mouse into a standing position and stood in front of my computer. But a good desk, a good quality desk, is something that maybe not essential, but it will help in your business. I mean, if you have a, a rickety, wobbly card table or something, and that's all you can afford or that's all you have, then, then so be it. But a good desk with some storage and some uh, real estate on the top of it for you to put notes and samples and stuff on the desk is essential. Now, with a desk comes a chair. And this is probably one of the biggest investments you want to make in your office. Well, maybe not as expensive as a computer, but almost more important than the computer in, in some aspects. I suggest when you look at a chair, don't skimp. If you're going to spend money in your office, get yourself a good chair. Because after all, you will be sitting in that chair for hours on hours, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. When I first started from home, when I made the jump from the print shop and came home, I was sitting on a old wooden kitchen chair. This was an antique that my wife had inherited from her grandparents or something. It had been painted multiple times and it was a really nice wood design. And my wife, when I started work, she stripped it all. She likes doing that sort of stuff. So she stripped all the wood to the bare wood and put a nice coat of varnish on it. So it's a beautiful chair and we still have the chair. But for the first, I think seven or eight months, that was what I was sitting on. And even though I was said it was fine and it didn't bother me, afterwards, when I finally got a good chair, I realized just how comfortable, uncomfortable, I should say, just how uncomfortable that wooden chair was to work on. And I couldn't believe what I had been missing out on. Now, my very first chair was actually a Christmas present. My wife bought it for me to replace that wooden chair. And I had it for several years actually quite a few years. It was just this past year that finally it got too worn, I guess. The the hydraulics on it would, wouldn't allow me to sit up. So as I was working throughout the day, the chair was getting lower and lower and lower, and I had to keep getting up and lifting it up. And after a while, it would be like every hour and, and every 30 minutes, I'd have to do that. And it just got really annoying. Not to mention it was a little wobbly at some point, so it wasn't as solid as it used to be. And that's just normal wear and tear. I'd had the chair for 12 years, 11, 12 years or something like that. So it was time for a new one. And when I went out to buy one, as I said, I didn't skimp. I went down to a store. We have a store here in town called Staples and it's a, a business supply store. And I went into their department that sells office chairs. And when the salesperson came up to me and said, uh, can I help? I says, I'll, I'll find you if I need you, need you. I'm going to be here for a while. He says, I'm looking for a new office chair and I want to test these things out thoroughly. So, and I must've spent oh, a good hour and a half, if not two hours. And all I was doing was I was picking, I, I kind of narrowed it down to what style of chair I wanted. And I sat down in a chair and I'd sit in it for 10, 15 minutes I, they had some desks there. I'd roll the chair up to the desk and see how things were. I'd play with the adjustments. I'd check out the arms. And there were some desks that were really comfortable, but the arm rests were at odd uh, heights. 
I, I'm six foot two and I like my arm armrests to be at a certain height when I'm sitting down on my chair. And some of them, they were adjustable, but the armrest would be too low in one position. And then when I adjusted it up a little bit to the next position, I found them a little bit too high. So I ruled those chairs out. Some of them, the seat of the chair was a little bit narrower. So it was the chair finished kind of halfway, like halfway between my butt and my knees kind of. Um, and I thought that that might get a little annoying having it there. I wanted a longer base. So anyways, long story short, I ended up sitting, as I said, 10, 15 minutes in every chair and then going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for a good hour and a half to two hours before I finally decided on one chair that, yeah, this is the one I want. And it's the one I'm now sitting in as I'm talking to you. And you, you really need to try it out yourself. Now, that first chair that my wife bought me, that was something I had actually tried it out in a store one day and I said how much I liked it, but it was one of those cases where at the time, you know, money wasn't coming in as quickly. The business was, was still new and I kept saying, oh, I'm fine with the wooden one. I don't need to spend money on a chair. I'm fine with the wooden one, but my wife knew better and she knew how I was going to get sore and it wasn't that comfortable. So she went and splurged at Christmas and bought me that chair. But then this last one, as I said, I went in and I inspected each one until I found the chair that was right for me. So splurge on a good chair. It is where you're going to be spending your time for the foreseeable future. So it's not the place to say, oh, I'm going to save some money here. Now, that's not to say go out and spend a thousand, two thousand, or three thousand dollars on a chair. One of the chairs that I tested, and it's kind of funny, it was made by a Canadian company, and it's actually the same chair that President Barack Obama sat in the Oval Office. His chair was actually made by a Canadian company. And I tried out the chair, and I found it very uncomfortable. But it was good enough for a president, and uh, it did have a presidential price on it. I can tell you that much. I don't remember exactly, but when I saw the price tag, I just went, ooh, okay, this one's definitely not for me. But it was a good thing because it wasn't very comfortable. Okay, moving along, office equipment. After you splurge on a good chair, something else to think about is a desk lamp. I had mentioned earlier having good lighting in the room, whether it's a ceiling light or good lighting coming in from a window, but there will be times where you might be working at night or for whatever reason, the lighting is not that great. So a good desk lamp, something again that will not be heating up. If you get something that's LED or, or whatever, but you also want to make sure that it's not a color spectrum that's going to throw things off or make your eyes tired or like some fluorescent lights with their blue glow or, or sometimes they'll create this noise that you can hear. So you got to be careful and get yourself a good light that's going to create enough light for you to work on, but it's not going to be too distracting. Now, other essentials for your office equipment, a printer and a scanner, they're always good to have in an office. Scanners come in very handy when clients give you things or for whatever reason and you need to scan something in. A lot of these printer scanners, they, it used to be where you'd have to buy a printer and a scanner. Now, of course, the printers are scanners. So that makes it a lot easier. But get yourself a good one that is reliable and it can last you for years and years and years. Now, another thing is a filing cabinet of some sort or drawers or somewhere where you can store things so they're not just out in the open. I have a filing cabinet in my office and I keep important things in there. Yes, we're going to a more paperless society, but there are still paper involved with a paperless society. And there are a lot of things that have to be kept, tax documents, um, certain receipts, certain whatever they are, even if you want to keep samples I have one drawer that's dedicated to print samples. Whenever I get it, whether it's a business card, a postcard, a flyer, a poster, a book, whatever I design, I always try to keep one sample from the, the client. And I've got a drawer in my cabinet that has a, a file for each client. And I keep samples of the work I've done. And that comes in handy because sometimes a client will say, oh, Mark, do you remember this thing I did for you? And yeah, I could call up the file, but sometimes it's a lot easier to just go through the drawer open it up and say, okay, here's a sample of that brochure. And I actually have it physically in my hand. And I know not just what the computer file looks like, but sometimes holding it makes a big difference. So a filing cabinet for that sort of thing, not to mention they're great. I've the bottom drawer. It's a four drawer filing cabinet. I have the bottom drawer is where I keep old DVDs and uh, flash drives and, and different things like that. Old, 
wires that you never know when a, a certain wire, a USB cord or something might come in handy, as well as whatever else needs to be thrown in there. So it's a good thing to get things out off your desk, off your floor and store them into a filing cabinet. Now, another thing that I find it essential, but maybe you won't, and that's a paper shredder. I still get a lot of clients that pay me by check. And, and of course, when you get the check, you've got the, the check portion, and then you've got the other part of that you tear off. Well, those, I really have no use to keep that. But just throwing them out in the recycling or that, that has some banking information on it. So I'm going to shred those. Just like there, there's sometimes where I'll get certain invoices or certain papers or whatever. It's just a good idea to have a shredder on hand that you can get rid of these important or sensitive documentation that you, you might not want getting into the wrong hands. Now, other things to consider, phone. I have a desk phone in my office. Now, not everybody does that. A lot of people don't even have home phones anymore. We still do here. Some people work off their cell phone. But if you're not working on a cell phone, and I personally, I don't give my cell number out to my clients. I don't need them getting a hold of me 24 hours a day. I have my office phone. And after five o'clock, I don't pick up that phone. If it rings, it can go to voicemail. But if you're somebody like that, then a phone, a good phone, especially something with call display is essential for your office. And lastly, depending on how you work, some sort of tablet or drawing board or, or something like that. If you are somebody that does a lot of illustration or just likes working on that sort of surface, uh, I don't personally have one. I do have my iPad and I do use, there's a program called AstroPad that I use from time to time to connect my iPad to my computer and able to work that way. But I don't have anything like a, a walk-on tablet or, or whatever in order to do illustration or uh, just manipulate things in Photoshop and Illustrator, but some designers swear by those things. So that could be an essential in your home office. So that was my list for equipment. Now, there are things when it comes to supplies for your office, and I'll go through this one a little bit quicker. Some supplies could be things like I mentioned DVDs and flash drives. Sometimes clients will ask you for files and they might not want you to just put them in a Dropbox. They want something physical. So if you're capable of, and I know some newer computers, the new iMac I just uh, purchased recently doesn't have a DVD player in it or a burner in it anymore. So uh, luckily I did have a USB burner on the side that I had already purchased uh, a couple of years ago. So I can still burn DVDs, but a lot of people just a USB flash drive or thumb drive have some spares on hand and they don't have to be huge expensive ones. I mean, you can go sometimes to the, like one of those dollar type stores and pick up flash drives that are, you know, half a gig or one gig for like a dollar or two and just have a few of those on hand in case you need to copy some files to give over to a client and you don't care about getting that flash drive back again. Now, depending on how you work and, and if you've listened, listened to this podcast, you know how I work and that is Paper, notebooks, pencils, pens, that sort of thing. Now, some people do everything digitally, whether it's on their phone, on their, their computer tablet, on their computer, but I still like pencil and paper. I do have pens in my drawer, but I always have a pencil out. It's a mechanical pencil, and uh, it, it, I always have it on my desk. There's always notepads here in case I have to jot something down. I do have my notebooks that I keep track of my jobs and everything in. I've got my Hobbit leather bound notebook, and that's the one I keep track of all my clients and work in. But that is something that I think is essential for any office is just to have paper, pens, and that sort of thing. Now, another thing here that I'm going to mention, and this isn't necessarily an office supply, but if you're going to be drinking and eating and that at the computer, one thing is get yourself some sort of spill proof mug or cup or whatever. I don't drink coffee. Uh, I'm more of a hot chocolate drinker, but I don't usually do that during the day. I'm big on water and I've got a big bottle here. It's made by Camelback. It's a, what it says here, it's about a 25 20, yeah, 24, 25 ounce or 750 milliliter bottle of water that I keep nearby. It seals. So if the bottle falls over, I don't get water spilled everywhere or whatever I put in it. If I do put juice, which I rarely do, it's mostly water. But the last thing you want to do is to compromise your workspace because you happen to spill your coffee mug or your, your water glass or whatever. Trust me, 
keyboards don't like liquids. I've seen it happen before. I've had it happen to me before where somebody has spilt something and usually it ends up being one of my kids that got in and used the computer and, and didn't heed my warning that no liquids around the computer and something got spilled on it. It has happened before. But if you're going to be working day in, day out, purchase some sort of mug, whether it's a coffee mug or something for hot liquids or a thermos type thing or whatever, something that is spill proof. So if you knock it over, you don't end up ruining your equipment. And it's very easy to say, well, I'm careful. I'll never knock something over. Trust me, nobody ever plans to knock something over. But if it's there and it can be knocked over, it's just a matter of time before it is. And the last thing I want to mention here for office supplies, I mean, there's tons of other office supplies that I'm not even going to bother touching on. I mean, you can get, you can buy a stapler and you can buy paper clips and you can buy all sorts of stuff, but I'm just talking about essentials here. And one thing that mm, maybe not an essential, but something that I really like is these little holders or the, the ones I actually have are called tacos. They're little leather pieces, the ones I have that are shaped like a taco and have a tack at the top of them, like where the, the, the taco would meet or the, the top of the round part. There's a little tack there. So you can close them. And what they're used for is to gather your wires. We have so much equipment coming into our computer and peripherals and that the wires are everywhere. And I've got these little things. And the ones I got, I actually got at a trade show. They're from Dropbox, you know, the, the service that allows you to share files and all that. So it actually has the Dropbox logo uh, embossed in the leather on the side of it. And you put all your, t- your wires together and you wrap this thing around it and it just keeps your wires nice and clean. And you don't have this big mess of wires behind your computer, running down your desk, across the floor, wherever they are, whether you use something like this, a wire taco, or even if you just use tape, organize your wires make it really easy, clean and neat so that if you ever do have to move something, it also makes it easier if you've organized them. If you put a little piece of tape or a little sticker on your your wires to say exactly what they are, it makes it so much easier if you ever have to move something and disconnect things. And then it, you just look at the, the labels and it's like, this one goes here, 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 there, I'm back up and running again. So that's the last little thing. And I know I these wire tacos, you can find them on Amazon. You can buy like, uh, I, th- I think it's a pack of like 10 or 20 of them and they're really cheap. So just something to organize your wires or just go down to your local electronics store, whatever store, and I'm sure they have stuff to organize your wires. So that's office supplies. Now, the last thing I want to talk about for essentials for your home office, and that is just simply things that inspire you. You are a creative person. You are a designer. You need inspiration. So whether it's books I have a a shelf behind me here in my office that is filled with design books and other books that inspire me. I just ordered another one just before recording this podcast. There's the book Logo Design Love. I've seen that book over and over over the years and I've never owned it. Well, just about an hour before I start press record on this podcast, I finally, I looked on Amazon. It was on sale on Amazon. So I bought that book. So it will be added to my shelf there for inspiration. Now, I'm not just talking about books when it comes to inspiration. Anything that inspires you can go into your office and just anything that brightens your day. I've got swords in my office because I love swords. I collect swords. I've got, I think, 25 or 26 swords in my collection. Most of them are in my basement or or spread throughout the house, but I've got a few of them in my office here that I just love looking at. It's something that inspires me. I look back at my shelf that I said, I've got a shelf with books. Well, other things on that shelf, if I turn around here and look, I've got a Batman figurine. I've got a Joker figurine. I've got an X-Wing fighter chasing a TIE fighter. They're little models that I have on stands. I've got a hockey puck from my favorite hockey team, the Toronto Maple Leafs. I have a TARDIS from Doctor Who there and so many other geeky things that is just me. They fit my personality and they're things I like to look at the art on the walls, any sort of knickknacks you have on your shelves, plants. There are plants in my room. Now, I can honestly say these plants were not put there by me. My wife's the one with the green thumb, but they do brighten up the office and they're nice to look at. 
Another thing you can do is some sort of sense. If you have a diffuser or something, if you're sitting in your office all the time, why not make it a great environment and create some nice smelling space for you? So you can, if you want to burn candles, as long as they're done safely or have some sort of incense or even one of those plug-in things in the wall to create a good working environment. Now, another thing you can do in my office, I have a dog bed. I have two dogs here and a cat. And I've got a dog bed. If one of the dogs wants to come join me during the day while I'm working, right here to my, a little bit behind me to my right, there's a dog bed there. And oftentimes one of the dogs will come in, you know, come give me a little nudge. I'll pet him a little bit. And then they'll go lie down there and and just be with me. So that's something you can do. If you have young kids, you can have an area in your office with some children's toys. So those times when your door isn't closed and you allow the kids to come in, Maybe you can say, well, mommy and daddy are are working right now. And yes, if you want to be with me, that's okay. Go off there. There's some toys in the corner there you can play with. And sometimes that's all the child needs is just be in close proximity to you. They don't need to disturb you. They don't need your attention or assistance. They just want to be near you. And having a small area while your kids are young that they can sit and play, maybe a beanbag chair that they can sit in there with a book or if they, you let them use an iPad or something to play, just being near you might be enough. So little things like that for inspiration, things that give you ideas are a, almost, I would say, an essential thing to your office. It is your space. It's your personality. It's where you will be spending the bulk of your time. Make it reflect who you are. So that's what I wanted to talk about in this week's episode, the essentials of a designer's home office. Now, I would love to know what's in your office. (laughs) Kind of sounds like a a credit card commercial I I heard somewhere. What's in your wallet? No, but what's in your office? Please leave me a comment on the show notes page for this episode by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 88. And now this week's question of the week. And this week's question comes in from Laura. Now, before I get to her question, I'll just give a little bit of context here. I'll read her her full message just so you understand. She says, hi, Mark. I'm new to your podcast and was introduced to you from the print brokering one. I look forward to listening again. Interesting and rich in information. I'm a graphic designer and design instructor. After teaching graphic design full-time for 15 years, I started Orangish Design last year and teaching design again part-time. It's proving to be a great balance. Business is slowly picking up and could use the bonus cash from print brokering you talked about. I always thought about print brokering, but was concerned. If I'm honest, afraid of paying the printer up front. Your explanation makes perfect sense and you make it sound so easy. Invoice the client, they pay you, then place the print order. Here's my question. I use an online printer, Moo.com, and now plan to work with them as a print broker. When you say... Quote, you can make good income by adding a hefty markup to their prices, unquote. How do you add that markup to online printer invoices, yet present the marked up invoice legitimately to your clients? My clients always want to see quotes one, two, and three. Clients are pretty darn savvy these days. Thanks for your advice, Laura. Well, Laura, this is actually a pretty easy question to answer. You are quote one, two, or three. Whenever I have a client, why is it the clients always want three quotes? They never say, give me two quotes or give me four quotes. It's always three quotes they want. I don't know about that. Anyways, whenever they ask you for quotes, or I'll use myself as an example. Whenever a client asks me for three quotes, I give them quote one from printer A, quote two from printer B, and quote three is from me. And that's all they need. They can compare the three prices. Printer A is charging this much for the job. Printer B is charging this month for the job. And Mark is charging this much for the job. Now, the printer may ask, well, Mark, who is this? I know you're not printing it yourself. No, but I have a supplier that I can get them from. And they don't need to know the supplier. You're dealing with me. That's the whole thing with print brokering. Now, understand the brokering usually is you're dealing with these different people. But you can say or tell them, that they are trade only. And even if they're not, like I know Moo.com, anybody can go there. But if you can just tell them that I've got trade printers or I have people I deal with that uh, I I won't divulge who they are, but I can get really good prices, then your client most of the time will be okay with that. 
I have been doing this for years and years. And usually the first two quotes are local printers. And I won't lie. A lot of times I will go to the printer I know is more expensive. I will ask a quote. There's, there's one printer in town here that I don't know how many quotes I've received from them over the years. And I have never, ever sent a job their way because their quotes are always more expensive than any of the other printers locally. I don't know how they stay in business because they're more expensive for everything than the other local printers. But I purposely get a quote from them because I know how expensive they are. Then there's another one that actually it's the printer that I used to work at. I usually get a quote from them and they're usually kind of middle ground pricing. And then my online suppliers, I'd say hands down 90 5%, 98% of the time, I can usually get the job cheaper through an online printer, even when I mark it up. And then I supply that quote under my business name. So the client doesn't see who that online printer is. They just get a quote with my company name at the top of the quote. And I say, you can get it through this one. You can get it through that one, or you can get it through me. The choice is yours. And that's all you have to tell them. And if your client says, well, I want to know who you're dealing with, You just tell them, no, you don't need to know who you're dealing with. You're dealing with me. It's no different than getting a quote for renovating your bathroom. You you get a quote from a plumber for his services. You get another quote from another plumber, another quote from another plumber. You're not going to ask the plumbers where they're getting their supplies. Where are they getting the equipment from? You know, who's, who's giving them that? No, you're getting a quote from the plumber. And it's, it's no different than that. So when it comes to that sort of thing, Simply include yourself as one of the quotes. And as I said, I've been doing this for years. I've never had a client complain, especially if you're the cheaper price, you can tell them. And the client's going to understand that you are making a profit. You don't do this out of the goodness of your heart. You are making a profit off of it. So even if down the road they they find out that, oh, you know, Moo Printing was going to charge whatever $20 for this job and Laura charged me $23 or $25 for the job, That's despicable. No, they understand that you are doing this as a service. You are going to make money off of it. And as I mentioned in that print brokering episode, which was episode 49, by the way, to anybody who wants to go back and listen to that episode, resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 49. As I mentioned in that one, the local printers, I've actually arranged a discount with them. So I can, in their cases, give their quote to a printer and or uh, to a client. And if the client says, well, Mark, you know, I I really like that printer. I really want to deal with them. I know they're not the cheapest price you are, but I know that printer and I want to deal with them. I'm still making a profit off of that because I've made an arrangement. In in my case, it's 15% from the printer. Whatever quote the printer gives me is the quote I show my client. And I know that when it comes time to pay the printer, I'm paying that quote minus 15%. I keep 15% of that price as my profit. And if at some point, Laura, if the client comes back and says, well, I found a place online that can do it cheaper, so be it. I mean, it'll happen. I've had clients come to me and ask for for, uh, quotes from printers and they said, well, I can find this place online. And sometimes they'll tell me, like if I have a certain, like say I'll use your example, moo.com. I've done it before where I've gotten a quote from a, a company and uh, let's use Moo as an example, Moo.com. And I've increased that by whatever percentage. And my client came back to me and says, I just found this place, Moo.com, where I can get it done cheaper. Great. Here are the files. And I don't have to worry about print brokering. You take care of it yourself. But don't forget that you can mention that print brokering, one of the services is you take care of everything. You take care of making the, sure the files are okay. You take care of any problems with the printer, dealing with the printer. And you can just say, okay, here are the files. You, you worry with dealing with the printer then. And there are times when the client will go, oh, well, uh, I don't know. Okay, yeah, I know I can save money if I do it myself, but I don't, I'm not used to doing this. You are, okay, you know, I'll pay the little bit of extra money for you to do it. Even though you're using the same printer, but the client doesn't know that. So it's very easy in that sense, Laura. And I hope that answers your question. If not, you have my email address, follow up, and I'd be glad to help you. Now, if you have a question you'd like me to answer on a future episode of the podcast, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback and submit your question there. Now, I have an exciting announcement to make in regards to Patreon, where you can become a patron and support the podcast and Resourceful Designer entirely, the website and everything, for as little as $1 a month. 
I've got something in the works right now, and I'm not going to announce it just yet what it is, but I've got something in the works that will create some bonus content that will only be available for people supporting the show on Patreon. So for those of you that are already patrons of Resourceful Designer, I'll be reaching out to you shortly and telling you what this bonus stuff will be and how it's going to work. And for anybody else that's curious, head on over to resourcefuldesigner.com slash Patreon, and that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And as I said, for as little as $1 a month, you can support the podcast and you will receive this bonus content that is beyond this episode, but beyond this podcast, it'll be bonus content that will only be available for Patreon supporters. And I will be making a announcement on the podcast once things have been finalized with that. Now, before I go, I'd like to share another five-star iTunes review I've received. And this one came in from Cody Nolans from the USA. And he says, binge-worthy. This show is chock full of extremely helpful information. Mark does an amazing job curating great resources and has an incredible insight that are helpful for freelance designers, especially working from home. I strongly recommend this show for anyone working independently in the graphics web industry. Well, thank you very much for that great review. Now, if you would like to leave me a review for the podcast and help other designers when they discover the podcast, some people will look at the reviews to see whether a podcast is worth listening to. And when they see all these great reviews, it might be a little encouragement and all they need in order to press play and discover the podcast for themselves. So if you want to help in that aspect, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes, which will redirect you to the iTunes store in your country where you can leave a review for the podcast. So that's it for this week. Now, before I go, I want to remind you of the resources I shared this week, which are two newer podcasts, Logo Geek by Ian Paget that you can find at logogeek.uk and This Design Life by Chris Green that you can find at thisdesignlife.net. And don't worry if you're driving or out walking the dogs or mowing the lawn or anything like that. I will include links to both of their podcasts in the show notes for this episode. So all you have to remember is resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 88 and you will find the links there. But that's it for this week. I want to thank you one more time for tuning in and listening to the podcast, whether you're new to the show or you've been listening for a while. I do appreciate you tuning in. And if you like the podcast, please share it with a fellow graphic designer. Until next week, I am Mark DeCote wishing you all the best with your graphic design business. And as always, reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.